Thank you. A big thank you and uh, welcome to everybody, to the students, to the faculty, to Kingfisher Nation. Uh, I want to thank you all for the invitation to speak this evening at a talk that I've entitled The Trinitarian Heart of the Liberal Arts. And to all who have taken time for their busy schedules to be here. I'm a little hesitant, however, and not only because I'm well aware that I address a group of weary travelers after hikes near and far and two tough days of classes, re-entry being the most dangerous part of any Apollo mission. But also because one of the last times I related the liberal arts to something theological was Pentecost Sunday four years ago. I was at a conference at Hillsdale College run by the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. And I'd been meditating a little bit on the hymn uh, Veni Creator, Spiritus. And the phrase, Septiformis Munere, sevenfold in gift, kind of struck me. Because we were talking about the seven liberal arts. We have the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I wrote a poem about it that you'll probably hear toward the end of this talk and you'll know that we're coming in for a landing. And to further symbolize the number seven, I used for the meter, somewhat playfully, T.S. Eliot, after all, says poetry is a superior amusement, I used iambic heptameter, what the old English poets called a fourteener, for a fourteen-syllable line. So the poem starts, now seven are the liberal arts, as sages taught of old. Um, on Pentecost the Spirit came, his gifts to sevenfold. So upon sharing the poem and explaining it to some colleagues there, I explained that the only 14er that modern audiences uh, were likely to have heard was the theme song for uh, Gilligan's Island. <laughs> you know, so just sit right back and you hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started on, tr from this tropic port aboard this mighty ship. So fast forward two years later and I get a video call out of the blue from Andrew Seeley who runs that institute and he just says, you're not going to believe this. And he turns the camera around and he's at some event and a group of middle school children are about to sing and all of a sudden I hear now seven are the liberal arts as sages taught of old and sang the whole poem to the tune of Gilligan's Island <laughs> so you understand my hesitation I want to reserve all performance rights to anything that I might say in the next 45 minutes or so <laughs> and that brings us to the topic at hand so I'm not merely noting a numerical coincidence between the arts of the trivium and the quadrivium and, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and in this case, the arts of the trivium and the persons of the Trinity, even though I believe the gifts and the liberal arts have more than a mere numerical relation. What I wish to explain is how the relationship between the trivium and the Trinity encapsulates a vision which can, and I believe must, renew Catholic education in our fair land and elsewhere. So most of what I will share, as Mr. Kerr has said, comes from a golden volume by a friend whom I met in England and who passed away from cancer in 2014. So Stratford Caldecott was a Catholic, an Englishman, a lover of the United States, thanks to being an avid reader of Marvel Comics as a kid, and I believe a visionary thinker. When he found out he was dying, his mind kicked into high gear and produced a series of marvelous books in his last four years. As a matter of fact, when he was getting toward the end, he was worried that he was going to miss Captain America, the Winter Soldier, uh, because he was, he was dying, and his, his daughter, through social media, reached out, and every single Avenger tweeted a picture of themselves that said, Cap for Strat. And the producers got wind of it and whatever, they actually brought him a copy of the movie and he watched it and he died a couple of weeks later but he did get to see did get to see the film so he wrote beauty for truth's sake about the quadrivium and beauty in the world about the trivium but its subtitle is rethinking the foundations of education it's well worth your time and if my words do little more than scratch the surface and make you want to take a deeper dive into Stratford Caldecott's, Caldecott's short yet amazing essay I should be most pleased so we all know that education, etymologically, is a leading from. Any educational philosophy will be determined largely by what is judged the end point of the process and what is seen as the starting point. To change either of these is to alter the nature of education, for it means changing either your goal 
or your vision of the being whom you are educating. The failure of most modern education, in my view, is a disastrous consequence for our civilization, and it stems from getting both of these things wrong. So we mentioned T.S. Eliot already, and he has that famous line from Four Quartets that says, in my beginning is my end. If we understand the nature of the human person, we will know not only where to begin, but where we are headed. One does not get very far into the Baltimore Catechism before these questions are answered. Who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? To know, love, and serve him in this world, to be happy with him forever in the next. All Catholic education must stem from that amazing truth that we are created in God's image and we are created to live in communion with him. As Anthony Esselin points out in his foreword to Caldecott's book, how decisive for the Christian educator or for any educator of goodwill is the revelation that man is made in the image and likeness of the three-person God? That is like asking, what difference will it make to us if we keep in mind that a human being is made not for the processing of data, but for wisdom, not for the utilitarian satisfaction of appetite, but for love, not for the domination of nature, but for participation in it, not for the autonomy of an isolated self, but for communion. It's no accident that Caldecott has structured his plan for true education upon the three ways of the trivium, which themselves reflect the three primary axes of being revealed by God. Of knowing, that is to say giving, of being known, that is to say receiving, and of the loving gift. As Dante puts it, O light that dwell within thyself alone, who alone know thyself are known, and smile with love upon the knowing and the known. So tonight I'm speaking of the liberal arts in general, but we'll be focusing on the three arts of the trivium, the arts that have to do with language, and in a way, the arts which have to do with meaning and spirit, while the arts of the quadrivium have to do with quantity, and therefore more properly with matter. I shall attempt to unpack a bit what Caldecott is saying, as so beautifully summarized by Tony Esselin. How are grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric related to giving, receiving, and sharing? Mythos, logos, and ethos. Father, Son, and Spirit. I will let Caldecott explain his central idea. I have already written in Beauty for Truth's sake about the disenchantment of the world that took place in modern times. We have educated ourselves to believe that meaning and purpose, if they exist at all, are not given by a creator or divine source, but are invented and imposed upon the world by man. If as a society we agree on certain values, it must be because we have negotiated such agreement through the procedures of market or state, not because we have submitted ourselves to an object of truth. I wrote in that book of the need to recover a poetic way of knowing the meaning of things by reforging the connection between self and world. The self is not a separate substance condemned only to observe the world from a distance, but can understand it from the inside by a kind of imaginative sympathy, learning to read, no doubt at first naively, the language of nature. But what kind of education would enable a child to progress in the rational understanding of the world without losing his poetic an artistic appreciation of it. This is what I am searching for in the present book. He says the central idea of the present book is very simple. It is that education is not primarily about the acquisition of information. It is not even about the acquisition of skills in the conventional sense to equip us for particular roles in society. It is about how we become more human and therefore more free in the truest sense of that word. There's, this is a broader and a deeper question, but no less practical. Too often, we have not been educating our humanity. We have been educating ourselves for doing rather than for being. The liberal arts have their roots in Greek education and are central to the educational thought of the church. Hugh of St. Victor, who died in 1141, that's going back a ways. In his work, the Didascalicon, defines the arts of the trivium this way. Grammar 
is the knowledge of how to speak without error. Dialectic is clear-sighted argument which separates the true from the false. Rhetoric is the discipline of persuading to every suitable thing. The subtle, the subtitle, excuse me, of Hugh of St. Victor's tract is De Studio Legendi, on the study of reading. This shows that he's not only thinking of the trivium as three separate subjects that have to do with words, but three ways of reading, three approaches to the truth, three stages of learning that mirror Dorothy Sayers, three stages of learning as the parrot stage, the pert stage, and the poet stage. But they are more than stages, since they're not so much successive, one after the other, as cyclical and mutually enriching. In any act of knowledge, as in any act of love, the being of both the knower and the known, the lover and the beloved, is simultaneously given, received, and shared. So let's talk about grammar, mythos, myth, and the father. When we think of grammar, we think of rules. We think about it every day. But these rules are not arbitrary. They are the rules imposed upon us by the reality we are dealing with. Aristotle's logic begins with the categories, the predicates, the ways in which we say things about things. Right? But as I emphasize in my language classes, language has come up with ways of expressing what reality gives us. We live in time, so verbs have tenses. We experience persons, places, things, substantives, substances, nouns, that have qualities that we can express with adjectives. In no language are adjectives modified by nouns. Just as no supermarket is organized by color or increasing order of price. Right? Pope Benedict says in Caritas in Veritate, Nature expresses a design of truth and love. It is prior to us, and it has been given to us by God as a setting for our life. Nature is more than raw material to be manipulated at our pleasure. It is a wondrous work of the Creator, containing a grammar which sets forth ends and criteria for its wise use, not its reckless exploitation. So in any discipline, not just, not just the arts of language, in any discipline, we must begin with the basics, the basic truths that we are given. To ponder these is to grow slowly, gradually, in knowledge and appreciation for the nature and properties of what we are studying. We begin with memory, with memorizing certain facts, in the understanding of which we shall grow at a later date. It is very important not to get the basics wrong. There's been a huge push against, against memorization in, in English, in the, the language arts, which strangely has not been as strong in math, where it is pretty darn obvious that the times tables need to be mastered, or even in music, where scales need to be memorized. They need to be mastered. You can't do much without that. You can't dispense with the periodic table and do chemistry. But what do we learn first? Go back to your pre-K days. Right? We learn what things are called. We learn to name things. This is what Adam does. And through naming, we hear, so to speak, the nature of what we know. The Greek word for name, onoma, is related to the Greek word for law, nomos. Right? And this is where the Latin word for name, nomen, or where we get the word for noun, comes from. So to know the true name of something is to have some insight into its inner law, into its nature. By naming the animals, Adam rules them, but not for himself and his, and his own purposes. He doesn't make up the properties of a tiger. He doesn't, he doesn't invent which, which animals belong to mammalia and which don't, right? He does it in order to shepherd 
the world according to the inner reality of things, which expresses the wisdom of God. So to know anything is to know God in a new way, as ultimately the origin and creator of that reality. And that is why knowing anything, knowing anything that is true, ennobles the human being. So through this knowing, we have contact with the origin of things, their being and their purpose. So when we are given a gift, the first thing we must do is see what it is, appreciate it for what it is, understand its purpose, and understand and even respect the intent and plan of the giver of the gift, sometimes the capital G giver of the capital G gift. And that is why Caldecott relates the liberal art of grammar to the Father, who within the Trinity is origin. He does not proceed, but the other persons proceed from him. And also to mythos, which is a received story. It tells us the deep truth of who we are. It is not something that we are to rip apart and overanalyze, but to ponder in wonder. It is through the gift of tradition that we are first formed as members of a particular community. And in these traditions, we're connected to our origins. Right? A couple of years ago, um, my daughter Fiona, who did theology and uh, minored in music at Benedictine, she was asked, because a lot of the people, uh, students especially, weren't in town for Midnight Mass at Christmas time, and said, would she direct the choir for Midnight Mass at Christmas time? And we, they had some silence after communion, and she wanted to do a Gaelic hymn. So this, she wanted to do this song, I sing of the night at Bethlehem, Donicha Ude Mechel. And so I remember taking a, a video of it and sharing it with some family, and my Aunt Ellen who's kind of like the matriarch at this point, one of the last members of my, my parents' generation, just kind of texted me back, I can, I, can, I can hear the blood of our ancestors. Which, when you get older, I think it'll hit you differently. But there was that. She sensed a connection there, right? So there was, there was something that was going back, and you feel it in the blood. So understanding grammar this way which is not going to make declensions or conjugations any easier, by the way, right? But it definitely puts it in a different perspective. It makes any subject connected to the Father without having to re-inject religious symbols or vocabulary into the subject matter, right? I see some of these, some of these programs that say, okay, we're going to do, you know, spelling and then, you know, or we're going to do handwriting and it's only going to be Bible verses or it's only going to be I mean, anything that's true said by anyone, is of the Holy Spirit. St. Ambrose said that. I mean, the father of the church. Right? Quid quid verum a qualibet dictu a spiritu santo est. Right? Whatever is true said by anyone is of the Holy Spirit. Caldecott has this to say. The grammar we must learn is a way of using language to praise, to celebrate, to magnify. The experience of Eden is the experience of the dawn of language and the making of human consciousness. The remembrance of being and of seeing into the essences of things through words newly minted. The, word, the world of creatures is blazing with glory against a background of absolute darkness. And if the world no longer blazes for us, perhaps it is our fault. We are in Eden still, only our eyes have changed. My, my oldest son, Eamon, uh, I forget if this was in high school or at the end of middle school, he had to answer a prompt about, a prompt about what's your favorite word or what's your favorite sound, right? And people were saying different things. Remember there was one girl who, the scratch when, when you're when, in a guitar when you're changing chords and it kind of like, she just loved that sound, right? And my son said it was his name when it was pronounced excitedly. And I thought, what a selfish little rustin, 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 right? But when I thought about it again, I mean, that's the sound we're all, we all want, right? Come, 
right? Patrick, you made it, right? You passed your, 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 your final test, right? Your final judgment. Come, when, when, when you're welcomed by the Father, your name will never be pronounced with more meaning, right? It is you, fully known and fully received. So, let's move from there to seeing the second art of the trivium, dialectic, logos, and how it relates to the Son within the Trinity. So after learning to read, learning to name, knowing our origin and the nature of things, we move on to discerning truth for ourselves. Not only understanding what tree means and what green means, but being able to make judgments for ourselves based on that understanding. That tree is green. And thinking through all the conclusions that can be drawn therefrom. So dialectic is largely synonymous with logic, defined by John of Salisbury, who died in 1180. There's going to be a lot of the 12th century in here, just a warning. He says, it's the science of argumentative reasoning which provides a solid basis for the whole activity of prudence. So we go from a wondrous awareness of the world, mythos, to a more self-conscious awareness of our place within it. Know thyself, from the oracle at Delphi, is the bridge between mythos and logos. So this logos, the principle of the intelligible order, is the source of all things. And it's pursued by each man by the homing beacon of his own intellect, even when pursued only implicitly. Right? Even a bunch of atheistic scientists, like the modern community of physicists, what are they trying to find? The theory of everything, right? One truth to rule them all, right? So at this stage, we search for truth even as we still ponder it. We begin to take responsibility for our own thoughts. And it's the job of the educator, the teacher, to shepherd the student's innate tendency to truth. Esselin quotes an educator here who says, healing is done by our bodies, yet we need doctors. Growing is done by the plants, yet we need gardeners. Learning to think is done by young people, we need teachers, as we need doctors and gardeners to provide and protect the conditions, in this case, of good learning. This, I suggest, is done in three ways. By securing the appropriate environment, by guiding pupils towards the subject and topics that are most worth learning, and by presenting ideas in an order that makes it easy for the learner to grasp for himself both this subject and its relation with others. It is obvious enough, I think, that these three tasks are essential to good teaching, but they can be so taken for granted that we rarely think about them directly. She says again, this is Margaret Atkins, a good teacher orders the explanation of a particular point in a way that builds a bridge between the truth of her subject and the individual mind of the pupil. She orders the topics within a subject, or at least appropriates or perhaps modifies the order provided by the curriculum. She's also responsible for ordering this subject in relation to others so that her pupils can see how it fits into the wider intellectual tradition of the school. Right, so when you, just a little suggestion for you guys. Do you know why you're studying each of the subjects that you're studying? Do you know that there's a, there's a reason why this is being done now? Right? And at the Gregorian University, we had mostly oral exams, right? And you'd, you'd go through an entire semester, and then at the end, your only evaluation was 10, 15 minute oral exam with the teacher. That's your only grade. It's all the credits are riding on that, right? And you'd be asked, they'd have a 10 or 15 questions through the whole semester. Normally, they'll give you, they'll give you two, say, pick one of these. But one of the best ways in order to pass an oral exam like that is start by saying where this 
where this little theme that you're going to talk about fits into the entire treatise, right? How does, it, how does it fit within this? And how does the subject that you're studying fit within everything else that you're studying? Because if you understand that, you understand why you're understanding that, right? It's, it's, uh, it's Aristotle's example of the architect versus the bricklayer. The bricklayer is putting the bricks, he knows how to do it. But the architect knows why those bricks are there in that particular place, right? And that, that is... Um, Wisdom. So, whereas grammar is about what, dialectic is more about why. I love the log, but it, it doesn't give me a lot of room to maneuver here. So, Chesterton is a great example of a man who never lost the wondrous pondering of childhood. Right. So, the grammar of life was alive in him. But he still understood dialectic, which he often just called philosophy, right? And he understood it in a fresh way that many philosophers would benefit from. Listen to what he says. Philosophy is merely thought that has been thought out. It is often a great bore. B-O-R-E. But man has no alternative except being influenced by thought that has been thought out and being influenced by thought that has not been thought out. Right? So that's your only alternative to thought that's been thought out. The latter is what we commonly call culture and enlightenment today. But man is always influenced by thought of some kind, his own or somebody else's. Right? Somebody said, what are you going to just do whatever the Pope tells you to do? I was like, yeah, what are you going to do? Whatever Justin Timberlake tells you to do? I think I made the better choice. Right? So you're always influenced by some thought of some, either your own or someone else's. That of someone he trusts or that of someone he, he never heard of. Though at first, thought at first, second or third hand. Thought from exploded legends or unverified rumors. But always something with the shadow of a system of values and a reason for preference. A man does test everything by something. The question here is whether he has ever tested the test. So where you're getting your ideas from is really, really important. And it's through dialectic, logic, logos, that the role of the Son in the Trinity is manifest. So within the Trinity, the Son orders. It's a principle of order. Our minds are ordered toward truth. Our wills are ordered toward goodness. And just that it is helpful and imperative in our moral formation that we see that all our choices, in all of our choices, we pursue one final and overarching good, any true education will help a student see that in all our knowledge we pursue different aspects of one overarching truth, with a capital T. Right? Think about it this way. The higher the intellect, the more one understands with fewer concepts, right? We've all met people who are like really, really, really fast in a particular field of endeavor, right? When I was, when I was in Rome, there was this guy named, I mean, his, we called him Brother Mustard because that was actually his name. His last name was Mostasa, which means mustard in Spanish, but it was, was his name. But I've never met a more mechanically inclined person. I mean, he had like a ratchet set, carried like a ratchet set around in his, in his cassock and whatever. It was like rigged up. But he could take apart anything and put, back, put, put it back together. And, and everybody was constantly asking him to fix stuff. And so he was praying his rosary, walking by. And they were, they were doing this fountain in front, of the, in front of the school. And they had the engineers there. And they had all these designs and whatever, and they said, oh, Brother Mustafa, come here, look at this. He finished the decade, walked over, and he goes, oh, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. And then he just kept going. They were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And these engineers like, were offended. They were like, come over here. He goes, look at these pressure differentials, whatever. It's not going to match. And he was right. Right? So, think about guys like uh, Bobby Fischer. Right? He's, he, he, he sees all the moves and all the consequences of this particular move and all the other potential moves because just he's a, a genius in that particular discipline, right? So what is 
the greatest possible intellect. The greatest possible intellect understands everything that can be understood in one concept. Well, that is the sun. Right? The Son is the perfect understanding of the Father. He's God's perfect self-understanding. And all that the Father can do, and all that the Father, everything that exists and everything that could have existed, understands it perfectly in one concept. So the confusion and error of modern education stem from a philosophy which makes each individual man, not the Logos, to be the ordering principle of the universe. Right? Started probably in the 1300s with nominalism and it led to a whole bunch of other isms. It's all you study in history of philosophy. A whole bunch of isms. And studying it, I was like, okay, I get what this is. It is a universal point, it is a particular point of view elevated to a universal point of view. Right? Mathematics is interesting. It explains some stuff. Maybe mathematics is the key to all that can be understood. Mathematicism, right? Gilson says, there's a lot of reasons Descartes was Descartes, but there's no reason to be a Cartesian, right? <laughs> Women are interesting, they're fascinating, right? God has created them, whatever. Maybe they're the key to the entire universe. Feminism. So think about, think about what isms can be justifiable, right? Who, what can make that jump? Well, Catholicism is one, because it already means universal. So it's not even a leap. And the other would be humanism, under, but you have to understand man from a certain perspective, right? Because if, you're, if, you're not, if you don't have a fully uh, integral understanding of the human person, then that humanism itself is going to be a reduction. It's going to be uh, a particular point of view. Caldecott quotes or speaks about uh, what John Paul II says in the encyclical Fides et Ratio on faith and reason. In chapter 7 of Fides et Ratio, the Pope looks at the contemporary crisis in philosophy and issues a challenge to philosophers to resist tendencies to eclecticism, historicism, modernism, scientism, pragmatism, and nihilism. That's, that's, that's the best of them all, right? Taking nothing, n nihil, and elevating that to a universal point of view. That's like multiplication by zero. The details need not concern us too much here. Eclecticism simply means a lack of a concern for coherent thought. Right? Just go pick, pick and choose, whatever. Pragmatism replaces the criterion of truth with decisions based on utility. Right? Utility being the highest good. It's the universe that you all encountered in um, Thomas the Tank Engine where the, high, <laughs> the highest compliment to be paid is to be very useful. The beginning of this whole tendency, he says, is a loss of the sense of being and meaning. And its end is the nihilistic denial of the possibility of any knowledge at all. Because right? if you go down one of those rabbit holes, you're going to end up not wanting to know anything. Thus, the will to power, exercised above all through the development of machines, gradually takes the place of the will to truth and goodness. Because if I can't find the truth, I'm going to just say, eh, everybody's got their own. And since I can't persuade you of my truth because it doesn't rest on anything that, that is objective, then I'm just going to have to for force you. You're going to try to force me to believe your truth and I'm going to try to force you to believe my truth. It's not argument anymore. It's just pugilism. This is the situation of philosophy today and the root of the crisis in our philosophy of education. The loss of the logos that our trivium must find a way to recover. Now, our own thinking, since we are persons, we are not isolated individuals, right? We are not people that have nothing in common with anyone else other than the fact that we're called human beings and that's a coincidence, right? No, we share a nature and our nature is dialogical. The best way to encourage that is dialogue, debate, conversation. Speaking in front of you tonight has helped me clarify my own thoughts and hopefully my words will spark your further conversation that will bring you deeper into the truth. So the, dialogue, the, the, the dialectical method, this idea that, that you have in your classes of 
kind of Socratic understanding, speaking about something, getting, getting to the truth, not because it's said and then it's memorized, but prodding you with questions until you come up with the ideas. Right? This method stems from a conversation that was designed to expose error. Right? That's what Socrates did by examining these people. But its purpose is to draw closer and to find the truth. So learning is meant to happen within a community, face to face. Right? It's lessened by mask to mask and lessened much more by online or virtual presence, even though I'm happy for the people that are watching this online. Right? So this is something Kingfisher Nation deeply understands. Right? It begins in a classroom community and then it spills out over to a wider conversation on a hike at the table, right? on the bus. So the gift that we ponder in grammar must be assimilated, received, made part of us through dialectic. Right? One of the things I love about this community here is this, this community of song. Right? And there's songs that you all learn and the freshmen are just getting to know them. Right? But by the time you leave, they're not anybody else's songs anymore. They're yours. And they're yours forever. Right? They become part of you. Let that happen with so many of the other things that you're being taught. We take responsibility right, for our own thoughts. They become our own. They become part of us. Don't you feel better when you give someone a gift? Don't you feel better when that gift you give becomes like part of the decor at the friend's house rather than being re-gifted or only hauled out when you visit? Right? Yeah. So does God. Right? So does reality, by the way. So it's when you see a, a virtuoso pianist, right? and for, for a magic moment, you wonder whether she's taking the music out of the piano or putting it in. Because at that moment, Chopin or Beethoven is, is revealed to you with a clarity that you've never heard before. So we, what you're witnessing when you see that is a gift fully received. We only hear the voice of the Good Shepherd when we follow. And when this following, more than something we do, becomes part of who we are. Okay? So, rhetoric, ethos, and the spirit. The example of the pianist underlines a natural transition between the last two arts of the trivium. If we're seeing a virtuoso pianist playing with great virtuosity, it is likely that you have not, creeper alert, stowed away in this person's private studio, but you are in fact at a concert. The pianist is not only proving that she's fully assimilated her gift, she's sharing it. We move from how we know, how we discover truth through dialectic and logic, to how we express the truth to others. How it radiates to them through us. So when we speak, we share ourselves. We reveal ourselves. In God, Caldecott reminds us, the knowing, thinking, and the speaking are one with the self-gift that is the nature of the divine. The perfect being is necessarily self-giving, self-communicating. Right? The Logos exists entirely as dialogue. The word spoken on the breath of God, Ruah, the Spirit. This doesn't mean he creates out of necessity, right? But God within his interior reality is perfect communication and perfect reception of that communication. If God created out of necessity, then it, everything would share the same necessity as God and we'd be in a pantheistic system. Right? I, 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 there, we're coming up to it. First, work, first week of October, second week of October, I'm going to be on the third floor of the Feral Academic Center at Benedictine and there's going to be some girl coming out of a class weeping and I'm like, well, I guess Dr. Shinkevich just had that class about God doesn't really need you. <laughs> well, he doesn't. Do you know how glorious God would be without you? Just the same as he would be. <gasps> I can't handle it. 
So God's inner being, yeah, is the perfect example of all communication. But it's an example that we can only imperfectly mirror. In creatures, knowing and saying can be distinguished, even separated. So our speech flows from us. But in order to speak truth, we cannot draw only on what is in us. Right? We have to put things in us that are true in order to express them. Such is the limitation of creatureliness. In order to be who we are, we must pass through what we are not. As T.S. Eliot says, echoing St. John of the Cross, to arrive where you are, to get from where you are not, you must go by a way wherein there is no ecstasy. Right? This, gentlemen, is why studying is hard, like anything that truly perfects us. Caldecott says, thought is an attempt to know. That is a marriage of self and reality, while speech is an attempt to bring about a meeting of selves, a communion in that marriage. So human speech and thought need to correspond with the order of the cosmos, with the order of love. But the truth that I communicate will only be effective, and effectiveness is the end of rhetoric, as correctness is for grammar and truth is for logic. The truth I communicate will only be effective if it is a truth that I have assimilated. Luigi Giussani was fond of saying that you can only communicate a truth that has changed you. I'm presently trying to change the method of teaching in our Latin classes. And we want to go to a more oral type of, of delivery. And that's not the way I was taught. So I had two options. Take a course myself and get good enough while I was teaching my other stuff to be able to teach it, or to hire somebody who had that kind of faculty. So I did take a class, but we hired someone anyway because he's way better at it. All right? So this is why when we talk about rhetoric, we also talk about ethos, right? character formation, morality. They fall within the rhetorical art widely understood. So it's not just memorizing rules but freely forming and internalizing habits until they become part of us, until people who experience us experience these values as radiating from us, so to speak. So I'm not just passing these contents on to you tonight. I'm sharing with you something that I've come to know and love, and by sharing them, I come to know them more deeply. So philosopher Kant's question, what should I do? He has these questions that are the basis of all philosophy, according to him, right? What can I know? What should I do? What is it permitted to me to hope? But this question, what should I do, is, should be a much deeper question. Who am I called to be? What type of being am I called to be, right? Because in my being, what am I doing? I'm sharing the things that I have assimilated. And God is calling me through everything I come to know and everything I come to love. I have only two choices. I can either be or fail to be what God has created and called me to be. Ultimately, the final exams pass fail. So the best way to communicate and to teach morality is not just lists of rules, but by example. The mythos of the lives of the saints, right? And the lives the lived witness of teachers who live their love for God through love of knowledge and goodness and love for their students. Right? Seeing a virtuoso to anything makes you want to know that field of endeavor better. And it makes you respect it because its beauty has been shown to you. Right? Think about that. Right? For, me, for me, one of the best uh, advertisements for this school was somebody Ask Patrick, and I don't want to call him out, because, but I'm going to, right? And he talked to this person. I was, I was a fly on the wall. He talked to this person about for, for like 45 minutes about everything that goes on about he, here. And he said, then we do this, and we do this, and we do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so and so, and this guy's such a beast at this, right? Which is, I guess, virtuoso in my, in my word, right? 
It's a person who does this and it makes me want to know that, right? It makes me want to do that. It makes me want to master this, that particular thing like this person has mastered that particular thing, right? So this view leads to an education in true freedom. Not in the freedom of indifference where we each make up our own truth, our own rules, but the true freedom where we are free because we free ourselves from being what we shouldn't by confer conforming our lives to God's truth for us, right? I mean, we have to free ourselves from stinking at being human, ultimately, right? Because if we're not, we didn't do that that well. I mean, that's, that's basically what a examination of conscience is, right? How'd I do today, right? Under par, over bogeyed that one, bogeyed that one, right? So that's what we talk about a virtuoso, somebody who is virtuous, right? Somebody's mastered the art, as the saints have. What art is that? Of being, of being human, right? The real you, I've written this in a lot of college and, and high school yearbooks, the real you is saint you, because that's what you were created to be. On this basis, says Caldecott, we can at least understand the essence of rhetoric, which is not a set of techniques to impress, oratory or eloquence, nor a means of manipulating the will and emotions of others, sophistry, aka advertising, but rather a way of liberating the freedom of others by showing them the truth in a form that they can understand. So as we read from Hugh of St. Victor, rhetoric is the discipline of persuading to every suitable thing. Nobody can be persuaded of what they don't understand. To persuade what we are saying must shine through us in such a way that others can grasp it and feel its inherent attractiveness. Thus, St. Albert the Great's definition of beauty, splendor forme, the splendor of the form, finds echo in John Paul II's encyclical on morality, the splendor of the truth. A reality's form, its essence, its depth, is seen so clearly that the truth is manifest. Right? Heard this country song and said, she came in, you know, she came into the bar looking like a woman should. I'm like, what does that mean? Think about it. I mean, you have to have a very deep understanding of the feminine genius to know what that means, right? What, what particular type of beauty is being sung there? You say somebody, somebody's good looking, what does that mean? It means it's good to look at them. Looking alone is a good. Right? Because there's something manifested there that is good. And it, it, it could be the beauty of a, of a perfect backward pass in, in, in rugby, one of these no-look passes. Johnny now who's, plays rugby at Benedict and he keeps showing me these clips. And, I mean, the wizardry of some of the stuff that's been going on with Ireland, I must say, lately has been fantastic, right? But it's, but it's also just, how, how, how did Mariano Rivera's fastball just all of a sudden go just move at the end, the cut fastball, just all of a sudden veer away. Looks like a fastball to the last seven feet, and then it moves. And it's not like, it, it, he knows it's going to do that. That's what he's trying to do. And it does exactly that, right? It's good, and it's beautiful, right? Because he, he believes it was a gift that was given, because all of a sudden it started happening, and then, but, but he learned to master it, right? So, this is a truth that I dare say need not be explained to kingfishers, right? Who know that each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors each one dwells, right? Selves, goes itself. Myself it speaks and spells, crying what I do is me, for that I came, okay? So it's here where Caldecott speaks again of poetry and the arts, especially drama within the curriculum. And he says, communication in the fullest sense involves the whole person, body, soul, and spirit, with imagination and intellect in harmony. So the culmination, the consummation of the liberal arts is man fully alive. Man's fully living out the truth and goodness of his nature. It is seen most beautifully in service to others, and especially in that communal act whereby we worship our first beginning and ultimate end. 
For by grace, as kingfishers also know, I don't merely speak and spell myself. I say more. The just man justices keeps grace. That keeps all his goings graces. Right? So the liturgy is, is not an add-on in Catholic education. It plays the same role in education that it plays in life. It is the source and summit. So thus, the arts of the trivium are not only three, coincidentally three, with the persons of the Trinity. These arts of the trivium would have to do with words, the words by which we come to name things, know things, and communicate them, more fundamentally have to do with the Word, with the capital W, who is the source and summit of every truth we learn. In our struggle to learn and educate, we become more free, more liberal, and more human, and thus better live out the truth of our calling, our naming, our baptism. We do this, as men like Stratford Caldecott have shown us, through mythos, logos, and ethos, within a tradition that embraces Western civilization, from the Greeks to the fathers to the scholastics to the great educators of today, down to those through whose intrepidity and vision, bold endeavors like St. Martin's Academy come to fruition. Now Severn are the liberal arts, as sages taught of old. On Pentecost, the Spirit came, his gifts too, sevenfold. The arts, they free the mind to climb, seek truth, its proper end. The gifts complete and aid ascent, mere nature to transcend. But gifts alone will scarce perfect who's never contemplated, as fertilizers wasted on a field uncultivated. St. Thomas prayed the double cloud his soul was born within might study banish with new light, both ignorance and sin. So Lord, this Sabbath, seventh day, we bow in your cathedral, and raise a prayer of thanks on high for favors heptahedral. <laughs> for by the three and fourfold way may we embrace what's true. May then the gifts inflame our heart and love see all in you. And we do this, ladies and gentlemen, not only by properly imitating, imaging if you will, the persons of the Trinity in our minds and hearts, but also in all we do giving glory to the Father to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you. You got time? Yeah, clapping because it's over. I get it. I don't know how much time we have. Do we have time? I haven't. We have a few minutes if, uh, if there are questions. Sure. So, questions, concerns, protests? Um, I was a little confused by what you meant when you said that God doesn't need us. Could you, could you clarify that a little bit? Well, because he's still who he is if we never existed. Peter's getting a little teary eyed. <laughs> I mean, he chose, he chose to create us, right? And so, once he did create us, he has a vested interest in us sticking around, right? If you, if, if you get on the team, the coach wants you to play, and he wants you to do well, right? And he wants you to contribute to the victory of the team. But if you weren't on the team, because you weren't around, then it would be fine. Right? So God, God does not receive, it, it's, it's, not, it's not us giving glory to God that fuels the divine being into existence. He's still who he is in his perfection without us. Right? Now, think of this. Did you ever cook with your mom when you were little, like five or six years old? She didn't need you to do that. Okay? She chose to involve you as a favor to you because it was a lot easier not to involve you, right? But um, 
think about that, right? Our collaboration with, with God is a lot like a five-year-old in the kitchen. <laughs> right? We kind, of, we kind of get in the way. We don't really do it. But, you know, at the end, he says, look what you made. Right? <laughs> and he doesn't mean the mess you made. This thing that he did, you know, almost all the work for. Right? Somehow, we, we get the credit for. So, I think, I think it's in that sense that, that God doesn't, strictly speaking, need us. Sir? Um, I have a question concerning um, the necessity to educate or reinforce the students that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Um, and this is in contrast to what I grew up with um, on evolution and as such. Um, how do you do that with students at Benedictine or if you, um, if you talk to other types of students with this problem? Kind of the evolutionary question, All right? So how can you? How can you? Um, I mean, that's a whole other talk on its own, right? How how is it compatible a teaching on evolution with being made in the image and likeness of God, right? So we are the marriage of uh, quite a mixed marriage: slime of the earth and spirit of God, right? Now, slime of the earth could very well be a process. Right? But we have to safeguard God's direct intervention at certain moments in the process. Right? When the first human being was created. Right? And when each individual soul is created. Right? That's slime of the earth, right? Spirit of God still happens at every conception. Right? At every human conception. So, I think that, I mean, Justin Martyr, St. Augustine, right? On a literal reading of Genesis, right? That's the name of the book in which he writes this, right? It says, I don't see how you can explain this other than there's this process that God has guided through every step of the process. And what has happened in our modern world is that we've probably become better at seeing the process scientifically, understanding what steps, because our powers of observation are greater through whatever instrumentation we're using. Right? But that still doesn't take away the fact that there's something more when you get a human being than just a more complicated molecule than some subhuman life form. Right? There's a reality that's there that doesn't exist before. And that reality, if it's a new reality, needs an explanation. Right? And it is something that nothing in the world can explain. Right? So I think that there's, there, there's a way in which those things can be uh, rendered compatible. Right? The problem with a lot of the evolution is, it's being, uh, as it's being taught, it's being taught in a way that it's, it's a substitute for for creation. Okay? Sir? Um, a big premise of that book, from what I recall, was the purpose of uh, all formation is to develop a habit of attentiveness. Uh, is there anything, is there any like, thoughts that you have on that, or ways that you've cultivated that habit in yourself or your students? I'm probably an undiagnosed attention deficit everything uh, in some ways, right? And I, I, I thank God for, for Latin and Greek because in Latin and Greek there's so much you have to pay attention to. There's like so much grammatical information in every single word that I had, I had no other option than paying attention and through that fascination occurred. Right? And then, then I was fascinated by the fact that you can have only one letter and it can mean several different things depending on what sort of accents you're putting on it, right? talking, talking about, about Greek. So I, I think that there are going to be certain subjects that call out to the nature of, 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 of particular persons. Right? They're more inclined. Right? There's, somebody's more inclined for, for math. Because right? normally, 
Right? People come to me, what should I, I have no idea what I'm going to major in. I'm like, good, chemical engineering. They're like, no. I'm like, well, you know something you're not going to major in, right? That's at least, at least narrows the field down, right? But I'd often ask the question, what are you good at? Because that is probably <laughs> a key there, right? That God's given you a talent in this area, and therefore he wants your contribution to be around that talent, right? So for me, for me, it was always through language and, and literature. I liked math too, but I was ne I was, it never captivated me in the same way. And partly, I think, is because I was taught these are a bunch of formulas to memorize and plug it in and whatever. If I was ever taught Euclid the way you were taught Euclid, I think that, that I mean, I don't say I'd be, you know, a scientist, but I think I, think, uh, I would have developed greater attentiveness in the mathematical arts than I would, have, I would have otherwise. So sometimes there's just no other way to do it than, than to, to start slow, right? To do it. Somebody says, oh, you know, I really can't really read a whole page. Well, then read half a page, right? Just, just like with a piece of music, right? Trying to play it at, at the tempo in which it's written the first time is a recipe for disaster, right? You have to play it slow enough so that you can play it correctly and then gradually increase the speed. Well, that, that follows in a, in, a lot of, in a lot of different disciplines, right? And I think the attentiveness goes beyond, goes beyond school. It's, 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 it's a habit for life. Pay attention to the person that's in front of you. Right? And we, we, don't, we don't have uh, a resume of impressive academic achievements of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We, what we do have are examples of her attentiveness. They're missing. There's no wine. Right? She's the one who figured that out. Right? The, 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 the Magnificat is, is, is a, a meditation on being attentive to what God has been doing in the entire world and therefore what God has been doing inside of her as well. Right? So I think that uh, the, the idea that at the end of Fides et Ratio he shows the, Our Lady being the example of philosophy. Right? To philosophize in Mary being, being uh, the, the, the height of that, of that dis discipline. And why is it? Because she, she reflects. Right? She's putting things together. Right, conference and corde suo. Right, she takes these ideas and she she puts them together. Uh, the, the Greek for that is symbolusa, right? Which is where we get the word symbol, and the word symbol, right? Like you look, oh, when I see that, that means fire, right? I associate I associate that icon or I associate that image with this with this thing, right? And so Our Lady developed that probably from her meditative. Re, uh, reading and meditating on the scriptures as part of her formation as a young, young Jewish girl, this idea of pondering what the Almighty has done, right? And then people would tell her things or the, the, the story that the shepherds tell or, the, or the, 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 what the kings tell. And she just puts, she files that away, right? And she thinks about that, right? And it's a fruitful type of, type of thinking. Right? It's, a, it's a thinking that, that yields fruits in her own life and in the other. So that's the same exact type of thing that we're talking about here. Right? Receiving a truth, assimilate it, making, your, making it your own, and then expressing that, then living that in front of others so that they can see the truth of it and they can, they can see the goodness of it. Not because you say it's good, right? but because they see in you that it is so. Okay, so come Monday, I will have about 36 page papers dropped on my desk about either the Iliad or the Odyssey, sometimes about both. And I tried to tell them, 
This is the difference between a high school paper and a college paper. Right? This is what the high school paper is. So I'm challenging you not to write high school papers. Take, let's take a theme. Right? Loyalty is present in the Iliad. Here, here, and here. Right? In this character, in this character, in this character. Or in this episode, in this episode, and in this episode. Loyalty's there. I say, okay, that's one way to think about it. But Homer is not writing about Hector and Achilles. He's not singing about Hector and Achilles. He's singing about you and me. He's singing about humanity. And he's doing it through Hector and Achilles. Right? Flannery O'Connor famously said, the fiction writer does not write about characters, she writes with characters. Right? You can't say what, what this painting is and just start naming paint colors. <laughs> That's not what he painted. Right? It's with what he painted. So, delving deeper into it, you say, Homer, through these characters, is showing that the nature of loyalty is this, this, and this. Right? Now, in order to do that, you first have to know the story. Right? And it was memorizing big parts of that epic were such a part of Greek education. And so many uh, of, of the authors after that, they would throw out, toss out a quote from Homer as a proverb or as something. And this is, this is the way we learned who we were. Right? I, I tell you a, a song that I've heard in this hallowed hall several times, but a song I already knew, but it's a song that never, never ceases to, to move me is The Minstrel Boy. Right? Because it's, it's such a simple song, a simple rhyme, right? But the second, the second verse of that song, right? This, the, the heroic act that he does of destroying something that he loves because he will not, he will not engage in it in a foreign land. He will not en engage in the songs of a free man while under captivity. I mean, I hear by the rivers of Babylon, right? I hear the, 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 the songs of, of, of the Jewish people in exile in, inside, that, inside that song. And it's, it's, it's any time that we have, we have estranged ourselves, right? So, so what, what myth does, knowing these stories and knowing them well and hearing them, what that does is it stores up truths for us that later on we can assimilate, right? And later on we can, we can, we can make our own. I mean, we, we, we are unfortunately witnessing today, um, modern word, a deconstructing of the, the idea of America, right? And it's largely being done because these things are not handed over anymore. We're not, we're not hearing stories of Valley Forge and, 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 and George Washington. We're not, we're, we're not, these, these values aren't being transmitted because they're being challenged or, fault, or lied about or falsified. And, and what, what happens? What they do is they substitute other stories, right? And, 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 and certain other things become, become the, 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 the myths that become the identity of a people. So there's a battle there. There's a, there's, there's a battle to be fought there. But, but in, 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 our, in our education, right? There, there, there's there's going to be stories. You guys, I don't, I don't think you realize it. I don't think you'll realize it until you're, you're my age or beyond. What, how important it is to be the foundational generations of a school. right? You will do things that people will talk about. You, you, will be, you, ha you have a greater chance of becoming legend right? than people in the school 100 years from now. right? Because... You'd be the first. You're the first to earn this badge or the first people that, that, that did this or that started this particular tradition, right? So, I mean, talking, talk about the opportunity to become epic, right? You have, you, you, you have that gift more so than, than, uh, than probably future generations of this school. Thank you, Dr. Mahal, very much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, buddy. Bravo, brother. Bravo. 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 Thank you. I got a bottle of something for you. Okay. I think I saw that. Yeah.